So yeah, I'll be talking about when a mer person is a merman, which happens quite a bit right now in the emoji landscape. So a little bit about me. Sadly, this GIF isn't working, so I'm gonna ask you all to close your eyes and just imagine 3,000 emojis going past you right now in all their beautiful glory. Uh, uh, my name is Jennifer, I work at Google, I work on the emoji program, I work on everything from input and how the experience is using them from prediction to suggestion. I work on the visual design. I work with the Google Fonts team on how to improve and innovate on the font technology. Anytime there is an input field in a Google product and emojis can be there, I'm probably somewhere behind that. So send me your bugs. Okay. So I'm gonna start off with a little story about when I texted a friend in a meeting. Love a good mansplain face palm. And she on her iPhone got Love a good mansplain, face palm, but with a man. And that was deeply annoying. And even though both of these emojis technically are the same emoji because they map to the same code point, it appears that we have an outlier here that does not look like the others. And this creates all kinds of cross-platform inconsistencies because what is he doing in my Steam room? Do not want him there, right? I text my girlfriend, I feel so relaxed, and he's there. What are you doing there? Stop it, leave me alone. Okay. No one wants to be misunderstood. And it turns out this happens a number of times. I send you a mer person from my Pixel device, and on an iPhone, I get a merman, right? Or uh, maybe on your iPhone, you send me a dead man, a little zombie. I, on my, my Android device, get a dead woman. And Basically, what's happening here is vendors have given gendered designs to emojis that are not supposed to be explicitly gendered. This creates a number of problems even when there aren't inconsistencies. These designs, for example, for construction worker, it's not supposed to be construction man, just construction person, and we end up defaulting to stereotypes and reinforcing them. Police officer also universally defaults to a to a gender presentation of male. However, person pouting is a woman. And person frowning all happen to be women as well. And this is deeply annoying and deeply stupid. The profession emojis are all men. The emotional ones are all women. OK, so let's talk about a document called TR51, which is kind of like the emoji bible. Like it tells you what the guidelines are, how to enforce it, not enforce it, but how to like what to do when, you, uh, when you're trying to execute on this. And there's a line regarding gender that quote says, other than the above list, shown here, human form emoji should normally de be depicted in a gender neutral way unless gender appearance is explicitly specified. And that's really great guidance until you realize, as of Unicode 11.0, of the 87 emojis that are defined as gender inclusive, most vendors do not have unique designs for these glyphs. Okay, so what we're gonna do right now is talk about the 13% that do present in an ambiguous manner. And here they are. We have child, adult, older person, snowboarder, baby angel, baby, skier, person in bed, fencer, person in bath, horse racer. Okay. So let's kind of zoom out and look at it across all the different vendors. And what we see is that eight of these 11 emojis are unique in that they exist without any male or female counterparts, meaning we don't have woman in bed or man in bed. We don't have baby girl or baby boy. These emojis exist purely in this neutral space. The other three of the 11, child, adult, and older person, do have counterparts. And these are all supported by all the major vendors. So here, let's take a look at that, right? So we have a nice spectrum. We have, a lot of, we have some children, we have some adults, and then we have our elders. So the optimist in me thinks this is great. This is a really good signal that vendors are trying to create a design system that can scale to all the code points. However, when you look at what vendors are supporting as of just 11.0, most of the emojis are not. So this is a look at uh, what Apple supports. Uh, again, these are the 11 that we just went into. Microsoft as well. Facebook. Twitter. Samsung is interesting, as usual. Samsung is always interesting for their own unique reasons. 
they have decided to support gender inclusive superhero and gender inclusive supervillain. And I tried to find out why before this talk and didn't get, didn't get the information in, in time. However, I suspect it's because their face is mostly camouflaged, right? It's easier to support it because they're more obscured. Just a theory. Okay. Google also largely does not support most of them. We do support family, kiss, and couple. The rationale behind that is those are concepts, right? The concept of kiss shouldn't be heteronormative. The concept of a couple also shouldn't, and, and family as well. Okay, so largely all the major vendors subscribe to the binary. And UX plays a large role here in why we should care. This isn't merely we should do this because it's the quote right thing to do, right? There's always an actual business decision or a user reason. And if you look at the keyboard, what we have is a lot of bloat. Like I said before, we have over 3,000 emojis, right? So when you're in there scrolling, looking for the right emoji, and you have to look at your keyboard on Apple, you're forced to choose between the two binaries right next to each other, which isn't ideal. And then on Gboard, you're forced into a gendered, it's, it's only one gender, one, one person emoji per gender, and you're forced to, it's like a mix match because we have men for some gender inclusive code points and we have women for others. So it's really not clear actually what you're inputting when you're on your device. Okay, so once I realized that this was happening, we had to address this poor implementation. The visual design of these emojis would largely greatly improve the experience in the keyboard and when communicating. So some of these gender inclusive emojis would simply require a change in hairstyle or clothing color. Uh, another group would require more refinements of accessories and props and body language. And the third is really gonna force us to stare gender in the eye and figure out like, how we're gonna reconcile it. Now, some have argued that these emojis really don't offer as much visually, but you really can't avoid race and gender any more than culture can, right? You have to stare it in the eye, stare it in the face in order to understand it. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the signifiers that make something feel either male or female or both male and female. Now, gender is a construct so in exploring signifiers that can have potential to communicate this ambiguity, it's important to remember that gender lives dynamically and on a spectrum, and there's no single visual design solution that will really convey the idea of gender inclusive. So giving quote unquote ungendered emojis a gender inclusive appearance is not trivial, right? Gender inclusive designs are intended to represent a person of any gender, you could argue, argue that a gender inclusive design works if the gender inclusive artwork is truly ambiguous to the viewer, but due to each individual's own perception of ascribing gender, it's possible people look at the existing male design and say, oh, that's a woman with short hair. Or they look at the woman design and say, well, actually that's a man with long hair. So where does that leave us? Are there signifiers that can provide clues that don't rely on the gender binary, like haircut, clothing, body language or color, facial features. What level of detail is too much? What level of detail is not enough? Because emojis really do demand an instant read. So we need to figure out what are those markers that will be effective at communicating a spectrum of gender presentations at a small size. Contextual clues can influence perception. Professions associated with one gender more than the other can impact your perception. And what if they're zombies? What is your gender if you're undead? Is there, is there gender? And that's sort of the point, right? Like context is king with emojis. After all, contextual elements are very effective in clarifying meaning, provided that a conflicting feature is not present, right? So the, the emojis that are least misconstrued are ones that have embellishments like hearts or uh, a halo. They, they basically have these props and accessories that help you understand what it means, right? So, um, so what in some ways clothing and accessories can inform perception. Um, for a mer person, who's right here, we had to be use body language to kind of create some ambiguity there. Uh, for a vampire, make it distinct from male and female. We gave it a tasteful chain. Um, these kinds of flourishes help people understand how it operates in the spectrum. Same for a person playing water polo, I think. So they have a full rash guard. Given how fluid and dynamic language and gender presentation can be, 
It's not inconceivable that regardless of haircut or shirt color or these accessories, some emojis will be repurposed for some other manner entirely. So right now we have a princess and a prince. So what's a gender inclusive princess and prince? Like, is it an emperor? Is it a head of state? Is it, what is it? Like, these are the questions that we would have to ask in order to move forward in creating a representation that feels gender inclusive. So we're gonna talk a little bit about 12.0. So 12.0 includes the first phase of making sure that our emojis are more gender inclusive. And we launched this in the beta of last March, but it became public in September. So if you have an Android device and you can update to the latest Android Q, I recommend it because you can see them in all their glory. And we went from this last year to this this year. So now all the code points where that are explicitly gendered are now have unique designs. This included not just working on the visual design of the emojis themselves, but the keyboard as well. We overhauled the entire experience in Gboard, not to plug it, but if you have, don't have it, you should download it. And you can actually experience what it's like to go through, again, 3,000 emojis with only flipping your thumb a couple of times. There's infinite scrolling, we have higher density, more clear iconography, improved search, uh, with sticky preferences, so you don't have to change it over and over and over again. Uh, and we also have hundreds and hundreds of new emoticons, which I also worked on. Uh, and what I love about these is that I don't have to go through a two year long process of emojification. Uh, we can look at the gaps that exist in emoji and say, you know what? There's no real good look of disapproval emoji. How about a hundred of them, right? What about hugging? We don't really have a really good hug emoji. We have the ones with like the like kind of gropey fingers, right? So instead we have a bunch of hugging emoticons and the same for crying. There's all kinds of different tears. There's happy tears and sad tears. So emoticons really help us uh, round out the emoji inventory as well. My, my background is data visualization and applying that kind of thinking to the keyboard has been really helpful in that you're dealing, there's a lot of similarities. You're dealing with a high level of dense information that you want people to navigate without having to be overburdened with all that information. And so one of the things we did was reorganize the keyboard in a way that felt like, even if you didn't know what you were looking for, you would know it when you see it and you would know it by looking at the other contextual emojis around it. So now we have this beautiful rainbow of hearts, circles, and, and squares. We also organize our emojis horizontally with increasing emotional intensity. So if you go from the left, you see a smile, then a smile with the eyes change, they get a little bit bigger, and then they get a little bit happier, they, they're smiling eyes, and then the teeth get clenched. So each individual emoji, as you move left to right or right to left, uh, the intensity changes. So we have the first row is happy, to you're so happy, you're proud, and there's tears running down your face. The next row is love, you have like kissy, smiley kissy, smiley kissy with blush, smiley kissy, kissy with blush and heart, et cetera, et cetera, until you're like overwhelmed with love. And what this also meant was an overhaul of our people category. So I don't just make these decisions like rogue, right? We do a lot, a great deal of research around understanding how, where people expect to find these emojis. But then I also work with the emoji subcommittee to say, listen, right now, smileys and people are its own category. That doesn't make sense. That's not how people use these emojis. Let's break them apart, which we did. So now we have, as you can see, the icon, we have a smiley emoji icon and a people emoji icon. And when you go to the people section, you immediately get all the people, including activities, roles, sci-fi, et cetera. And what's wonderful about this now is they're all gender inclusive. One thing we do do that's a little bit different from the standard is we do put emojis in more than one category. For example, lobster, right? Lobster, is it a food or is it an animal, right? So we have lobster in animals and in food. Arguably, because it's red, it's probably just in food. But you know, I know that they're, they're, we put him in the animals as well because it feels like he deserves to be there. And there's a number of emojis that really don't subscribe to just one category. And now when you long press on your person, you get a range of different kinds of people and different genders and different skin tones. And what this does is it cleans up the keyboard so it's much easier to find what you're looking for. You don't have to look for a, a, twice as many emojis it, as it relates to people at least. So when we launched this, there was some really fantastic feedback. People were overwhelmingly positive about it, and that always feels good. It always feels good to get some response, even when it's negative. 
And what's interesting is actually finding the ones that are bringing up relevant points. So this person brings up a really interesting point where these aren't being marketed as people emoji, but people are thinking of them as non-binary. People are looking at them and they're saying, these are individuals that are androgynous. And what that means is because that's their gender, they're expecting for them to be at other multi-person emojis. And that's not something the committee has really considered. So understanding what people's expectations are of these people so that we can make sure our system scales in the future, especially as we're approaching families, is really critical. Okay, so phase two. That was just phase one, all right? So we got phase two. Phase two simply requires changing some designs for existing code points. So these two particular fairly obscure emojis are man with skull cap and levitating businessman. They both have interesting histories, which I will not get into today, but they're easily Googleable. And really the only recommendation here is to remove them from the explicitly gendered list on TR51 and create gender inclusive designs. Now phase three requires a little bit of a deeper understanding about how gender is encoded with emoji. There are two real formats, right? One is you put, combine a person emoji with an object emoji. So school teacher, for example, is person plus school. Now you have a teacher. And there's a sign format base, which is person plus a sex symbol, right? So if you want woman shrugging, it's person plus female, and you have this lady. Okay. This is important because as you understand phase two, it's to apply the gender inclusive designs to all of our roles. So we have scientist and teacher and factory worker and farmer, and they follow this pattern. And uh, just last week at the UTC meeting, we decided to move forward with a uh, pretty, like, pretty rare dot release. So you'll be seeing something in the future called 12.1 that will include a number of these emojis. And in anticipation of, <laughs> there is one Google emoji in there by accident, but in anticipation of this, Apple is also supported uh, rolling out more gender inclusive designs. So you can have more confidence that when you are sending this emoji cross platform, they are seeing something very similar and you won't be misunderstood. So now comes the hard part. There are 12 remaining gendered emojis. Princess, woman dancing, Mrs. Claus, bride with veil, pregnant woman, breastfeeding, woman with scarf, Man in tuxedo, bearded person, man dancing, Santa Claus, and prince. Okay, so what do we do with these guys? So an easy example of this is simply to change man in tuxedo to person plus man symbol, right? That means the existing code point becomes person in tuxedo, and you can add code points for female and male. So now we have Jane Bond, Jesse Bond, and James Bond, right? We have the whole suite. Makes sense, it scales. It also scales to person in veil, woman in veil, and man in veil. But what about Mrs. Claus and Santa Claus? Like, do we need a gender inclusive version? Uh, what would we do in that case? Because these are, as you can see by their code points, they aren't like, they are a specific individual uh, code points. So we can't just like add an object to it exactly. So the resolution here was to create a mixed clause, right? Uh, and mixed clause is gender inclusive. And what's interesting about this is it follows an established pattern, right? Adult plus Christmas tree. Okay, that's a mixed clause. And for those who are like, but you know what, Jen? There's no such thing as mixed clause. I got bad news. There's no such thing as Santa Claus, right? So like, actually, we're on the same page here. <laughs> so this is the one that stumped the group a bit, breastfeeding. Do we simply change the existing code point design and remove it from the explicitly gendered list, thus creating breastfeeding person? Okay, that's one option. What we then could do is scale that and say, you know what? Let's then add woman breastfeeding by adding a gender sign and man breastfeeding by also adding a, a, a gender sign. But some folks didn't feel comfortable with that and they really wanted to keep the established design that is associated with this code point as explicitly female. So where does that leave us? Since we don't have any signifiers for gender inclusive, meaning like a sex symbol, which is intentional, we only use objects, it doesn't put us in a good position to actually add a gender inclusive breastfeeding creator. So what we resolved was said, you know what? We're just gonna push that over here. We're gonna create a whole new emoji, and it's gonna be person feeding baby, 
and everyone has bottles, and everyone's happy, and you don't have to use your boobs to feed them. Great, okay. And you know, in many ways, this is great, right? I personally believe we already have an emoji that expresses parenthood, which is tornado poop. <laughs> but you know, the question, of course, that we have to demonstrate when making a new emoji is, will these be useful, All right? So I could say that I could send my dad on Father's Day, happy Father's Day, poop tornado, but like it's more autobiographical. Like it doesn't make sense now that I'm in my 30s and he's like, what are you talking about? That was a long time ago. Okay, so what other emojis exist when you're texting someone like my dad, <laughs> happy Father's Day? You could be like, happy Father's Day, but like can't do this anymore because it means different things. And you can't really be like, happy Father's Day, dad, nice, like hand plus man, like really like there's no, there's nothing there that says like happy Father's Day. So what other emojis exist? Well, we got like golf and a tie and a hat and a hammer and a wrench. None of these really communicate the gratitude that I'm trying to express to my father over a text message. But with father feeding child, you do have something that can convey your respect and your love and your admiration for my dad. One of the beautiful things about illustration is how it deviates from reality. So I personally, on a personal note, when I was breastfeeding, I looked at the breastfeeding emoji, I looked at her, and I was like, damn, she makes it look so easy. Oh, like this was my situation, right? Like it was not exactly the same thing. And truth be told, the breastfeeding emoji really doesn't even capture breastfeeding. Right, like the actual experience of breastfeeding. It's more of a noun than an adjective. So like, here's a short story of my twins. Right? These are, this is a picture of my boobs before my pregnancy. All right, and this is them while I was pregnant. This is them when they were born. This is them when they cried. These are my boobs when my kids fed. Uh, this is when my daughter preferred my right over my left. My son, who also preferred my right over my left. This was me sleeping. This was them crying again. And then much later on, this was actually the experience of breastfeeding. It's not that beautiful, idyllic woman feeding her child. It's this. Okay, so that's that story. Okay. So what do we do for phase five? Right, counting, we're on phase five now. For 14.0, we're still strategizing this. So this is all rhetorical. We're trying to figure out what is the right path forward here. Uh, we now are left with woman dancing, princess, pregnant woman, woman with headscarf, and man dancing, prince, and bearded person. Okay. So let's take an easy one. This is bearded person, clearly presenting as male. One path forward, again, is just to change the design for the existing code point to bearded person, right? We'd have this design. Feels good, like I get it. Like uh, uh, that seems to make perfect sense to me. But there's another path. What about creating a component? What if we created a beard component in the same way that we've done it for hair, right? If we went this route, then the existing bearded person remains stable and we could add person with beard by person plus beard component and woman with beard, oh well, that's the wrong, but woman plus beard component, right? But, Obviously, the question I get is, Jennifer, do we really need bearded women? To which I say, maybe we do, right? Because beards and long hair have been indiscriminate of gender throughout history. We have not just women with beard, but men with long hair and beards. And truth be told, this really isn't about giving women beards. It's really a question of, do people with long hair have beards? Because ultimately, emojis are shorthand for other things, and that literally having to be a woman. Again, you're bringing your own background when you're projecting onto these emojis, right? So we have it in ancient Greece, and in Renaissance, and in, in different cultures, and in different religions. And there are a great number of ways to use a bearded person with long hair. We have, I love Eurovision. Any Eurovision fans? Great, well, okay, a couple, fine. Now you have your Eurovision emoji. Uh, they're also culturally relevant. We now have a Jesus emoji, right? Okay, so let's talk about pregnant woman emoji. Explicitly gendered female. Again, the obvious low friction path forward here could be to simply change it to pregnant person. 
right? However, there is a lot of pushback around changing existing emojis designs because you want them to be stable. You don't want anyone to feel like their emojis are gonna change underneath them, right? Um, if we were to go this route, it would be very easy to scale this to both women and to men. But again, the assumption here is, Jen, do we really need pregnant man? But there's a lot of literature out there that is communicating and demonstrating that the unsexing of parenthood and childcare is leading into unsex the unsexing of, of, of pregnancy. By that I mean, you don't need to have boobs to take care of your child. And as we see the law move forward here, we're seeing more people want to refer to uh, pregnancy more, um, more, more inclusively, right? So the British Medical Association's guidance on, uh, on referring to people who are pregnant says to refer to them as pregnant people rather than pregnant women. And the reasoning was because while a large majority of people who have been pregnant and have given birth identify as women, there are intersex men and trans men who may get pregnant. While that is a small minority, we also have Jessica Clark, who is a US-based law professor, who suggests that the law could see pregnancy not as something that only happens to women's bodies, but also a bodily condition experienced by people who don't identify as women. Terminology could be changed to women affected by pregnancy or gestational mothers, or to persons affected by pregnancy or gestational parents. But really, the pregnancy emoji goes beyond gender, right? Hear me out, right? So I text someone, oi, I ate too much Chipotle, burrito, smiley face with the tongue sticking out. It doesn't really convey how uncomfortable I feel, right? Like, I feel bad now. That smiley face is like what I may have said before, like, let's go get Chipotle, right? But afterwards, it's not exactly how I feel. Now I feel more like this. I feel full. I feel heavy. I feel pregnant with a baby burrito, right? And that is the beautiful thing about language and how people repurpose emoji is that they're fluid. While Unicode and the emoji subcommittee may say, here is a pregnant man, the people ultimately decide how language operates, right? Because language emerges from the human minds that are intersecting with each other. And what I love speaking at conferences like this is they force me to zoom out of my tiny little world and realize that we're in the middle of a story and not at the beginning and not at the end. And we're actually able to witness this in real time. So regardless of what we as a consortium approves in the inventory of Unicode or how Google or Apple or Microsoft or whoever renders them, Storytelling is for the people. The symbol just brands it and sells it. And to be fair, aesthetics are largely opinionated, right? Like when Apple rolled out their, uh, their peach emoji, everyone was like, love it, it is a butt. Thank you for this butt emoji, we love it. And Apple was like, no, uh, mm -mm. no, 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 no. You, there's no butt here. And they tried to, design, they tried to redesign it in uh, the 10.2 beta. And everyone was like, how dare you take away our butts? We demand butts. And so Apple brought them back their butts. And so despite a uh, brand that wants to control its image, again, it's the people who really decide how it's used. And a peach has gone from being a butt to becoming something entirely new and becoming something political. Going back to the roots of emoji, the shift in creating designs that kind of show off retina screens has left a critical part of what made emojis useful in the first place. Like letters and words, the abstraction of emojis allowed them to operate as part of language. Take the cocktail glass emoji. It's no longer just the idea of a drink. It's like very specifically a martini with an olive straight up. Like it's just not, it's just something very different. And this shift doesn't add more choice to our emoji vocabulary. It changes their semiotic function. Over time, the visual language has shifted from abstract to very specific illustrative ones. And now we have a fully stocked bar in our keyboard. We got a cocktail, we have like a fruit cocktail drink, I don't know, beer, wine, champagne, more champagne, and some sake. Okay, so over the years, emoji have evolved from encoding concepts like bird or happy to becoming stand ins for one's identity, right? Sometimes the emoji is literally what you look like, sometimes it's just how you feel, and other times it's what you do which means that the emoji for woman doesn't mean woman as much as I expect it to specifically mean me, Jennifer Daniel. And that's just my own vanity 
being projected on my keyboard. I expect to have that connection. And we see this constantly in the demand and disappointment of the red hat emoji. Everyone wanted a red hat emoji and we were like, great, we can give that to you. We gave it to them and they're like, wait, there's no red headed surfer? We didn't get a red headed shruggy? Are you kidding me? Same for requests for natural hair. There is a demand for hair in a manner that feels more like an avatar system than encoding a language. But a brief moment of silence. For the original gender inclusive emojis, the blobs, which I love and I miss every day. This is great uh, graphic by Scott McCloud, who's wrote a book on, called Understanding Comics. If you haven't read it, but you're interested in what I'm talking about, I highly recommend it. In it, he talks about that when you remove as much detail as possible from a drawing, you're more, you're more able to accurately convey the idea of something than reproducing reality, right? And take the man bathroom sign. Why does this mean man and not just person, right? This should just be person. Well, someone had to add a skirt to another one and they're like, oh great, that means woman and that means man. When really this could have been a perfectly acceptable default that is gender inclusive of both men and women and everything in between, but instead it's a man which truly reinforces a very man-centered society. This tweet dated from 2016 haunts me every day. When Android dropped their gender neutral emoji designs, I miss them. Look at them, they're so cute. Um, I don't really know what the blobs were. Like, look at this dancer. What, what, it, what are they? They are just having a good time. I don't know what they're dancing, I don't know what they're dancing to, but they really do capture the idea of dancing. Meanwhile, on the other side of the fence, other vendors like Apple and Twitter were like, we got a flamenco dancer, come dance with us, right? And when you're working in a system outside of your own, something that you control, you have to make compromises and you have to think and anticipate how, what people expect of it and how it'll be used. And as you watch emoji design evolve in 2015, at Google redesigned their beautiful dancer to another flamenco dancer, which is great and fine and good and really good for people because now they know that when they send this dancer emoji, it will look similarly across different platforms. But what did we lose when this happened? Does this really represent dance? Does this represent boogie woogie or uh, I don't know, like Polynesian dancing. It now alienates a number of other dances because we've gotten so hyper specific. And even now, the flamenco dancer has become tremendously sexualized to the point where I can almost see up her skirt, right? It's no longer carefree. It is now something that truly feels hyper specific which complicates things if we're going to try to create a gender inclusive version of woman flamenco dancer and man disco dancer. There's a couple options, just throwing them out there. These are not switches that being, are being proposed at this time. One option is to, which would be really radical, change the existing design for the code point for flamenco dancer on the left, right? That is not a possibility. This is far too much of a popular emoji. It is iconic. It is not something we want to really touch. And that we would do the same for Disco Dancer, but let's be honest, no one really uses that emoji, so it's not as relevant. Okay, so what's another option? Do we add a person dancing emoji like we did for uh, um, Santa Claus and Mrs. Santa Claus? So we just have adult plus music sign, and then we have this break dancer, and now we have a suite of gender inclusive dancers, right? But this provides, this doesn't scale, right? Because then when you look at breakdancer, you're like, well, I want a male breakdancer and I want a female breakdancer. And I also want like a female disco dancer. And what about a male flamenco dancer? All this does is introduce more complexity. So exploring that for a second, what if we did have person flamenco dancing and men flamenco dancer? And what if we did have person disco dancer and woman disco dancer? Now, we do have a draft candidate emoji for disco ball this year, or for next year, I suppose. So potentially we could combine it with the disco ball to create a person plus object format emoji. For flamenco dancer, it's a little trickier. We don't exactly have a good icon for that, but there is potential to kind of go down that route in the future. And that's sort of what's really important when thinking about these systems that need to scale, is not just thinking about how it'll operate today or even two years from now, but really five years from now or 10 years from now or forever. And the beautiful thing about language is how it evolves and how it doesn't stand still like formal writing, right? But it's like water and it's fluid. 
But Unicode is Unicode, and its waters are still, but they are very deep, and navigating them has been a journey. So thank you. That's it. That's all I got. I try to leave time for questions. Rick? Yeah? I do. Okay, cool. Excellent. Yeah, text. I think what you're referring to is like, is there a new encoding path here that allow people to do what you're describing? Because right now, what the way emoji operate wouldn't permit that kind of, well, let's say, freedom. Um, I think there are some. Well, right. I mean, there's the different questions. Like, one is like, how do we meet expectations about what people want? And another is like, how do we create, uh, how do we make sure that emojis are still performant and not being bloated when we have an influx of all of this, right? So, one is um, the font technology, right? We're going into a space where we can create composable fonts, where they are vector based. They are much more lightweight, which is great, but also, I kind of prefer. I like that there's a constraint <laughs> in the file size because then we can't exceed it, right? But now there's room to add lots more emojis. So that both is a blessing and a curse. Okay. The other one is if you want people to customize, I think there are ways you can do that outside of Unicode. Like, I don't know if that's necessarily within Unicode's expertise, responsibility, and there's things that other vendors are doing to meet that expectation. Uh, Google has something called uh, basically like customized emoji. Take your picture, turns it into you. You can it makes all the emojis your face. Apple also has something very similar to that called Memoji. Uh, there's stickers and gifts and a number of other things, uh, and that I think will help. A couple things. It's their differentiated features, which brands care about, which allows Unicode to be a, a unifier rather than a differentiator, which I think helps everybody. And then it also allows stuff that we learn from that, from those experiments and that iteration, and bring that into Unicode. What do people actually use? What do we understand about that? Is that, a, is that a meme or is that going to be sustained for a long time and, and bring that into the, the standard? So that's, how, that's at least how we're thinking about it right now. Jenny. I mean, some emoji fonts are bitmapped. Most of them are. Um, the way they're composed also can be vector-based, but the way it, it lands on your screen can still be bitmapped, but as long as the file size is small. Um, I can talk a little bit about it, but we do have Rod from Google Fonts in the room. <laughs> and I, I feel like his expertise around composable fonts might be more uh, articulate. And that's why Microsoft's font exists. Not to, Judy is also in the room for Microsoft, but can also speak to like the aesthetic and the, how the font technology limits certain things you can do uh, visually. Um, but there's a lot of work being, and it's well documented. All the all the font work is, yeah, yeah. It's already here. Like Microsoft's been using it for like a decade. It's just with that technology, there are limitations. To Rod's point, you can't use gradients, right? Like, so it would dramatically change it. So until it can support that kind of work, then. It kind of stuck. 
はい Yeah,、uh, we, well, I will say that a lot of academic research is what we rely on for exactly what you're talking about. So there's some great research that exists that, you know, so there's a lot of problems that's well documented. They're like, look, people don't understand each other cross platform. Look at all these different designs. But if you actually just look at one design, let's just say like the smiley face emoji. When you show that emoji to folks in China and they look at it and they go, I don't trust that person. That is someone who is humoring me. They do not actually, they're not actually smiling at me. There are some, there's something going on behind that face. However, when you show that same face to someone in America, they're like, that person looks happy. That seems fine to me. So people culturally are looking at emojis differently. Like what we do know, there's a great study about how, what activates in the brain when you look at faces in different cultures. In American cultures, they're looking at the mouths. In Asian cultures, they're looking at the eyes. And so actually, that becomes a focal point of how understanding an expression in emojis. And this goes beyond emojis, right? This is about how people just communicate person to person as well. And so it's understanding like, those primal instincts and then distilling it in an illustrative form as well. We work with linguistics,、uh, linguists, not linguistics, but linguists as well, to understand patterns in emoji use and how they're used、uh, both in terms of repetition as punctuation. Or when they're used more, I, pe- pe- I think people like to think that people make sentences with emoji, but really that's like a crossword. Like no one's communicating in crosswords, right? But effectively, an emoji game where you're like this plus this plus equals Ghostbusters, that's a puzzle, right? And those are fun and people love puzzles, but that's effectively and, and is a valid use of emoji, but isn't where we're seeing the most frequent use of it.、Um, there are a lot of interesting cultural differences as well based on age.、Um, Folks who are older interpret face screaming in fear as fear, but teenagers look at that and they're like, that person looks surprised and shocked that I just gave them some interesting news. They don't interpret it in, in the same emotional、uh, vector.、Um, those are just some anecdotes, but largely we rely on more academic、uh, explorations of understanding emoji use across different cultures. Thank you. So, I, I don't know, were you here for the first part of the talk? I, I went in a little bit. So, do you want more detail or should I recap a little bit? Oh, it's okay. No, no, no.、Um, I'll be sharing the presentation too. So,、uh, they're, clearly, they're videotaping.、Uh, so, there'll be more of it later. But a lot of it is trying to anticipate how something will be interpreted, which is very tricky. And so, trying to explore any number of different ways that this can be understood. Uh, we tried to rely on color. I didn't talk about color, but we tried to rely on colors that felt that they weren't biased. So we used an orange for gender inclusive, a green for man, a purple for women,、uh, not to reinforce like, the pink and blue of, of boy and girl.、Um, uh, I don't know. The, we, we, I mean, the, the, the approach for the gender inclusive design was very different than how we approach just, like, I don't know. A、uh, slug emoji? Is there a snail emoji? You know, like that's a very different kind of process,、uh, which is interesting in its own way, but there's, there's different approaches. I don't know. What are you interested in? Because I'd be happy to clarify. Got it. Great. No. That's a great question. So, one of the things we do is we, do, we operate in this space that makes people very uncomfortable, which is ambiguity, right? So, when someone looks at this, are they unsure of their gender? That's actually a good sign that we're in the right direction because they're not looking at it and saying this person is definitively male or female. Also, when they look at it and they think, well, this could be both male and female, that's also a good signal that we're going in the right direction. We tested this with multiple skin tones, different hair textures, different hair lengths. 
eyebrow shape, jawline, color of the shirt. And that was just like for the regular character. And then we applied it to different roles like uh, doctor or zombie or other things that were both fictional and, and nonfiction. And then what was there another one? Roles, per color. I think that was, I think those were the different kind of angles that we were looking at it. Who, who's Apple? Um, <laughs> no, um, I think what there's a couple different from different perspectives, right? There's like the Android fan boy, girl, person says, I bought an Android and they have a connection to their device and they don't want to be reminded if they if they see something and it reminds them of a competitor, they're like, if I wanted an Apple device. I would have bought an iPhone, but I bought an Android device. I want something that feels authentic to this experience. But then there's the other person, like a, the basically what my job is, is to anticipate once someone on an Android device is talking to someone on, on a different platform and, and, and anticipating those problems. So in terms of taking Apple's lead, one, we don't have that luxury because we come out six months before them. We cut our, you know, the Android ecosystem, the beta rolls out in March and Apple doesn't come out till fall of the same year. Uh, so what we try to do is work on the consortium level. And we're building relationships with folks from all the different vendors and saying like, okay, this is the direction we're going for Ninja. How do you guys feel about this? Is it too angry? Is it too stealthy? Should we be showing less? Should we be showing more? And making it more of a dialogue than it being reactive to each other. Because I don't think that's sustainable. If, if everyone just sits on their thumbs and waits for Apple to do something, one, that's too much control for one vendor to be dictating what emoji look like, and two, like, you're at the mercy of, of something that you have absolutely no control of. So it's about kind of spreading that power around and making it more of a dialogue. And that's what is so important about the emoji subcommittee conversations is it not just being about the proposals or the priorities, but actually making sure that everyone cares about things and if they don't, understanding why. Like why don't you care about Ninja? <laughs> uh, and that to me has been a pretty significant improvement over the past year is nurturing those relationships and coming to conferences like this and, and actually like putting faces to names and not just being like, Apple guy, Google person. You know, it's actually like there's names behind those, those brands. So, um, but yeah. Hi. Uh, it's a great question. No, I mean, I think it's worth, even like if other people have thoughts on this too, I'd be very curious. Like a part of this is like opening the conversation up. I think that people want to be validated. People want to be seen, heard, recognized, understood, primal. These are primal needs. Now, they seek out that validation a number of ways, right? Like when you're a teenager, the music you listen to, the clothes you wear, the people you hang out with, whatever, like all that stuff, it, it becomes part of your identity and you get validated or you don't and you discard it, right? Then there's formal validation. That's like informal validation. Then there's formal validation like Unicode or like uh, the Supreme Court or any number of other formal me mechanisms. And I believe there are certain things that people are looking for, for that recognition, for that validation to be seen, heard, and recognized. And the question is, is that 
Unicode's role, whether they want it or not, right? Because there is an expectation. So I think natural hair, the request for natural hair is an interesting example of that, right? All the vendors have curly hair. They all look fairly natural, but honestly, like, black women's hair has been policed for a long, long time. And they've been told they can't wear it a certain way and they can wear it this other way and it needs to be a certain length or a certain style. And so they're not really saying, I want natural hair. They're saying, I want to be seen, I want to be heard. So navigating the complexities there is delicate and one that I think is going to be falling, falls to Unicode, but ultimately falls to the people who are executing on Unicode. So Google and Apple and Microsoft, et cetera. And finding other mechanisms outside of Unicode that can scale for that need and that demand. But even with things like customized emojis, that doesn't give you that same sense. It gives you a connection to your device. You're like, I love this now. I have my purple-faced, green-witched, you know, whatever bespeckled, you know, character. But that doesn't mean that I will be recognized by a formal court. And that's a dance that has to be played out. And so there isn't, I'm not really answering your question, but it is a space that I think we think about, we struggle with, and we will continue to think about more. All right, thanks, Rick. Thank you.